Okay, this video is the role of dietary fat in cancer. A lot of people have been curious about this and I've been reading about it, but indirectly. I didn't expect to make a talk on this, but I started reading about it and there's a whole bunch of references to it. It just kept coming up. Okay, so cancer, it runs on hypoxia. That's an important point. Look at this picture here, the waterfall by Maurice Etcher. Beautiful picture. Okay, but the point is, you're in an endless circle here. The water falls down the waterfall, but somehow the mill wheel turns and then that makes the water come back up and it falls again. So what's my point? When you read articles about cancer, you're gonna see all these cascades of negative events that reinforce themselves. They're a vicious cycle. It just gets worse and worse. Cancer grows, metastasized spreads, kills the patient, okay? But what I'm saying is, the smart thing is, what starts the whole process? And here are the things that start it. The big one is hypoxia. Well, gee, what's the major cause of hypoxia? Fat, okay, so fat's obviously a problem. All right, diabetes leads to hypoxia. Atherosclerosis leads to hypoxia. Oxidative stress is a significant contributor to the uh, pathologic cascade of cancer. What causes oxidative stress? Obviously fat, especially PUFAs, okay? Diabetes, by the way, a lot of fat will cause that. Omega-3s cause that also, um, uh, saturated fat is real big for worsening insulin resistance of diabetes. Iron overload contributes to oxidative stress. Tumor promoters, of course, the big one. Um, animal protein as put forth by ooh, T. Colin Campbell. Um, estrogens are also tumor promoters uh, for a lot of different types of tumors. Acidosis, and that occurs from animal protein, from sodium chloride. Um, immune suppression, immune suppression, especially excessive psychological stress, sleep deprivation, caffeine, but acidosis contributes to that, estrogenic sodium can. Okay, so anyways, what we're saying is in order to break this cycle of endless worsening disease, you need to break this cycle, and it's very doable. I mean, the only thing is though, you wanna break it the sooner the better because I'm reading these articles about cancer and um, when, the patient, when the patients where the animals were given fats, the cancer eventually gets to the point where it's very hard to do anything. So you wanna uh, treat the cancer sooner rather than later in a sense. Get your act together sooner rather than later because being sick increases your risk of cancer. Being healthy lowers your risk of cancer. So you don't just get, you're not just sick because you got cancer you got cancer because you're sick. Does that make sense? Okay, the role of fat in cancer. We're gonna show a bunch of picture slides here in a moment, but just briefly, hypoxia leads to hypoxia inducible factor, and that leads to vascular endothelial growth factor, and that leads to also the hypoxia causes reactive oxygen species. Those cause increased vascular endothelial factor, which causes more reactive oxygen species, and you get this negative loop going, like I showed in the, the picture over there. And hypoxia creates all these problems that lead to more hypoxia. Uh, vascular endothelial growth factor is gonna cause growth of endothelial cells. Uh, it's a chemoattractant for monocytes. They enter the subintimal plate, they become macrophages. Um, you get matrix metalloproteinases that digest the extracellular matrix. You get angiogenesis having leaky capillaries that cause clotting factors to come into the periphery around the cancer, and they form a loose clot, which causes more hypoxia, and it then forms a stroma, which is very much like wound healing, very much like inflammation. And inflammation, wound healing, and cancer, they all are related. And what's basically happening, here's additional support for this uh, metabolic theory of cancer, is it's not one mutation, that's ridiculous. It's a whole set of normal cascades activated that make cancer happen, okay? The normal cell transforming into an anaerobic-like bacteria and then activating the hypoxia, activating this whole cascade of wound healing and inflammation-like responses that stimulate growth, block apoptosis. Okay, so here's our first uh, paper on the subject, dietary polyunsaturated fatty acids. So that's things with more than one double bond. So poly is more than one, unsaturated means double bond, not saturated, okay, with hydrogen, so it's um, unsaturated. Okay, fat in relation to mammary cancer in rats. High fat diets promote the development of breast cancers in rats. Okay, uh, this is further evidence that promotion of mammary cancer by PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acid, vegetable oils, 
Um, a man, Omega sixes is especially, especially bad. Okay, here's another paper: reversal of high-fat diet and memory tumor genesis by lowering of dietary fat. So they took a bunch of mice, fed them a high-fat diet, 20% sunflower oil in this case, and markedly increased cancer. But when they gave them a fat-free diet, they had much less cancer. So it's just one more paper supporting this. And there's a lot of information on this. Inhibitory effect of fat-free diet on memory carcinogenesis. So it's a similar type of paper, this time with corn oil, 20%, lots of cancer. You feed them a fat-free diet, much, 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 much less cancer. Um, so just giving you some references if you want to go down that path and read about that. Okay, so here's, you know, how does fat cause hypoxia? Red blood cell, seven microns diameter. Capillary, five microns diameter. Has to deform itself to get through. Well, guess what? When you eat a high-fat diet, you get thick blood, blood splodge. In particular, LDL cholesterol sticks the red blood cells together. Rouleau formation, stack of coins like the French word. Now all these stacked up, stuck together red blood cells are bulky. It's harder for them to deform to get through that capillary. Blood pressure has to go up. <clears throat> Delivery of oxygen to the tissues is delayed. Oh, I forgot my diabetic capillary basement membrane thickening. That also decreases oxygen delivered to the tissues. Warburg effect, he's the German biochemist, won the Nobel Prize in 1931. And he showed that when you increase hypoxia, I've seen some articles saying by 35%, other by more than that, um, you deprive the cells of oxygen and they activate this whole hypoxia inducible factor, VEGF, um, cascade of events where the cells basically transformed into behaving like an anaerobic bacteria. In a sense, it takes tons of energy for a cell to be part of a modern human and working in an organ system. A liver cell has to do tons of work. It has to maintain blood glucose, break down glycogen, run gluconeogenesis, monitor the blood glucose level, detox anything that needs to be detoxified, excrete it into the bile, make bile. Liver cells got a lot of work to do, okay? That takes tons and tons of ATP energy. And the point I'm saying is, if it's hypoxic, it says, screw this, take this job and shove it. I can't do all this work anymore. I'm just going to try to stay alive, and I'm actually going to move the hell out of here. I'm going to go get a new apartment somewhere else. That's what a cancer is saying. A cancer is a pissed off cell. It's like a pissed off mitochondria. You don't want to give me oxygen? Then I don't make you energy, okay? Goodbye. That's the attitude of a cancer cell. Most cells die in hypoxia. But the cancer cells are one that said, take this job and shove it. I'm no longer going to work as an oxygenated, multicellular organism in an organ system. I am going to be like an anaerobic bacteria. I'm just going to live for myself and I'm going to get the heck out of here. Okay. So that's an important, you know, pissed off mitochondria in a sense. It's the mitochondria that makes the oxygen. It's mitochondrial injury from hypoxia that is the primary cause of cancer. And this is the metabolic theory of cancer. And there's tons, mountains of data that support this. The bogus somatic mutation theory that's in all the textbooks is way out of date. Okay. Um, and so this is important to know if you want to understand anything about cancer. You've got to, you got to know about Warburg and you've got to know about the metabolic theory of cancer. Okay, high fat blood causes hypoxia. We talked about that. Uh, meat's the number one carcinogen. Meat is totally screwed. The animal protein is a, is a cancer promoter because of all the growth factors. And the fat causes hypoxia. So that's an initiator of cancer. It's a big mess. Okay, and this was shown that, you know, you get peak lipemia at around five hours with saturated fat. But when you eat polyunsaturated fats, you get even more prolonged thickening and sludging of the blood. Okay, and this is some of the experience that showed that. Roy Swank, beautiful movie um, available at drmcdougall.com. It was made by Roy Swank where he's in the cheek pouches of hamster showing that there's a big drop in oxygenation and thick sludging of the blood. He showed a 32% drop in oxygen in the brain tissue. That's on page 364 of the Pritikin program book, um, but only a 5% maximum drop after a no-fat meal. And that's part of why uh, he used that insight to put his patients on low-fat diets. There's more to it than that, but that's a key part of it. Okay, this was the Peter Quo cardiologist in Pennsylvania experiments going back to the 1950s. He fed the patients a high-fat meal. And this came out of the idea from Ansel Keys, saturated fat is bad, promotes atherosclerosis. And what he showed was when you feed the patients a high fat meal, they get peak lip lipidemia, peak blood fat. They check their blood lipids every 30 minutes, between about four to six hours. And the patients would get angina, repeat attacks of their coronary chest pain. And by the way, I know a lot of my audience has seen these slides already. I'm going to go into tons of new stuff, but I just have to give this background stuff for the newbies so everything will make sense. Okay, if you eat unsaturated fat like the PUFAs, corn oil, vegetable, all the vegetable oils, 
you get more prolonged thickening of the blood and tissue ischemia. Okay, so it's worse. All right, when you eat uh, no fat meal, just carbohydrates, you don't get any of that. All right, now here is a problem with diabetes. When you eat the high dietary fat, this is a paper from Anthony J. James Hamilton, 2020, uh, inhibitors of fatty acid transport. And what they found was it didn't matter if you block the membrane protein transporters. The fatty acid in diabetes would just get across the plasma cell membrane of the skeletal muscle. And this is a mechanism to explain why dietary fat causes insulin resistance and diabetes. Because the dietary fat is able to get into the skeletal muscle and you can't easily block it. And I think the reason why is it like that is because humans are not designed to eat large amounts of fat. We're just not. Study the biology for yourself and you'll keep coming across that. Pritikin, nutrition genius, he said, fat is bad. And there's no way to win with fat that I'm aware of. I think this whole good fats thing is nonsense. It's just like the Mediterranean diet and an excuse to eat a lot of fat. And there's just fundamental problems with our body in processing large amounts of fat. So the fat was getting across the plasma membrane into the skeletal muscle causing insulin resistance and there was nothing that could be done about it other than to eat less dietary fat. And that the cause of insulin resistance by dietary fat, that's been known since 1927, the J. Shirley Sweeney paper, okay? And then it was confirmed by Hemsworth, confirmed by Rabinowich, confirmed by Kempner, confirmed by Pritikin, confirmed by McDougall, confirmed by Bernard, you know, what more do you want? Okay, here's the anatomy of mitochondria has an outer mitochondrial membrane, has an inner mitochondrial membrane. The space between those membranes is the intramembranous space. The space inside the center of the mitochondria is called the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, and we talked about with insulin resistance, instead of getting the normal delivery of electrons running down the chain to progressively stronger electron grabbers ending up in oxygen, which gets made into water, and then ATP, uh, then also protons are pumped out into the intramembranous space. Here's the outer mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane, and these protons are pumped into the space here, the intramembranous space, building up a very high you know, electrochemical gradient, and there's pressure in there. Those protons want to get back into the mitochondrial matrix. When they come through, they spin this little protein. It's like a machine uh, that makes ATP. Okay, so that's why the mitochondria make tons of ATP. But when you overwhelm the mitochondrial gradient here because of the excessive electron delivery to the electron transport chain in the setting of excessive dietary fat getting into the mitochondrial matrix. The, the complex three goes, I can't pump against this level of an electrochemical gradient. I can't do it. And it starts leaking electrons backwards and they bounce off a coenzyme Q, drop down onto oxygen within the mitochondrial matrix, which converts it into superoxide, which is a free radical. There's an unpaired electron in the outer orbital. And most of the time under normal circumstances, a little bit of this happens, but it's no big deal because superoxide just mutates, SOD just converts it to water, no big deal, okay? But when there's excessive amounts of this, because of excessive dietary fat, these superoxide free radicals go and start damaging things all over the place. It's like bouncing a super ball inside of a, inside of a house made all out of glass, and it just starts breaking stuff. Oh, here's an example of the damage that's happened. So when you get excessive uh, superoxide anions, you know, like I said, there's also, besides superoxide dismutase, the enzymes catalase, glutathione peroxidase, they help in converting it into water. But in the setting of uh, excess iron being present, you'll get more Fenton reaction, which favors them becoming a free radical, hydroxyl radical, trashes the membrane. Um, and so, and also just PUFAs in general can lead to lipid peroxidation and trash membranes. That's a big deal. We're going to come back to that. Okay, here's another paper. Vascular endothelial growth factor is a key mediator of angiogenesis. Well, what causes increased vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF? It's increased hypoxia. Hypoxia goes to HIF. Hypoxia-inducible factor goes to VEGF. Okay, so what does it say? In, v, in healthy person, VEGF promotes angiogenesis for the embryo developing, needs new blood vessels. For wound healing, that needs new blood vessels. Okay, but... In cancer, it's like the good things that VEG, Jeff, have been taken over, and now they're going to start causing trouble with the cancer. Before a tumor can grow beyond one or two millimeters, it's only one or two millimeters. That's it, if it doesn't have these ingrowth vessels. Um, it's going to need these vessels to make itself more nutrients and oxygen so it can grow and start to shed and spread. Okay, well, the tumor vascular formed under VEGF, 
is structurally and functionally abnormal, irregular shaped blood vessels. These capillaries are leaky, and that leakage of blood and clotting factors leads to uh, a sort of a loose clot, a loose thrombus around the area of the tumor, and that's going to then activate the platelets. They start releasing all these growth factors. There's also a release of anti-apoptosis factors, things that turn off programmed cell death. And we know a cancer cell turns off programmed cell death by upregulating hexokinase 2 instead of hexokinase 1, the first enzyme that phosphorylates glucose when it enters the cell to run through glycolysis. And that also binds to the mitochondria and it shuts off apoptosis, programmed cell death. So basically, you see what's happened here. The cancer cell is becoming immortal. Growth factors are being released onto it. Blood vessels are growing up to it so it can spread to other locations. All these bad things are going on. And it's like, how do you stop this? Well, you have to stop the hypoxia, which means minimize dietary fat. It means minimize dietary sodium, okay? Don't do immunosuppressive things. Get your personal philosophy right so you're more resilient, all right? Minimize dietary sodium, okay? The chloride is an anion, so it's going to displace the bicarbonate anions from the blood, lead to low-grade metabolic acidosis. The animal protein is full of sulfur uh, amino acids like methionine and cysteine, and those get converted partly to sulfuric acid in their degradation process, causes a low-grade metabolic acidosis. Acidosis favors a negative tumor milieu, tumor microenvironment favors cancer growth over its surrounding neighbors. Acidosis suppress the immune system. Okay, so basically it's sort of an all or none phenomenon. You either make things good or they're going to be bad. Okay, and so the good news of this talk is there's a lot of things you can do to make things good. There's a reason why some populations have almost zero cancer and there's other populations have tons of cancer. Okay, here's a paper from the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, Angiogenesis Update 2005 by this guy Dvorak. And here's what he says. Angiogenesis has critical roles, like we just talked about, in wound healing and inflammation. That's what it normally does, but it also is bad in cancer. VEGF type A, subtype A, is the most important one. Um, let's see. He talks about what does it do. It upregulates a whole bunch of transcription factors. And that's kind of an important point I'm making here is cancer isn't one little mutation. That's nonsense. Cancer is activations of cascades of... Um, many processes that are like wound healing, like inflammation, primarily driven by hypoxia. Hypoxia, hypoxia, hypoxia. That is a key thing to know, absolutely. Because once you start this wound healing process, you basically activate a whole bunch of things that enable cancer to grow and metastasize. Once, you've, uh, once VEGF is upregulated transcription factors, they make proteins to digest the matrix, the metalloproteases, uh, matrix metalloproteases. They make glucose type 1 transporters to get more glucose over there. So they're feeding the cancer. It's almost as if they're building the highway to hell, okay? And they also release anti-apoptosis factors. So what I'm saying is once you go down this hypoxia route, you're basically feeding the cancer. Remember that guy's book, John Kelly, Stop Feeding Your Cancer. Do not be giving meat and fat to your body to make it easier for this cancer to grow. No, no, no. You don't want hypoxia. Cut down on dietary fat. Cut down on sodium. The vascular basement membrane is an important impediment, blockage to microvessel enlargement because it's non-compliant. Okay, so you're going to digest it with these enzymes. That's what those matrix, matrix metalloproteinases do. They de digest the extracellular matrix. And you're also going to have endothelial cell proteases that will degrade their vascular basement membrane. So there's a synchronized, coordinated cascade of events that help this cancer cell to grow. Okay, so here's some more stuff from the same article. Uh, VEGF, promoting angiogenesis. Um, initially, you form that big clot because of vascular hyperpermeability means leakage of clotting factors in some blood. Um, and then once you've got that clot, it's sort of a soft clot, and that becomes tumor stroma. And the VEGF also has a chemotactic um, effect. Chemotactic means a chemical that causes attraction, and it attracts macrophages into the site, immune system cells. Okay, um, and here's, what does it say? It says, this forms a provisional stroma matrix of tumors also present in healing wounds and inflammation. Yeah, and this stromal matrix, like we said, you've got release of growth factors, you've got anti-apoptosis factors being released, a perfect soup to grow a cancer. Um, and that's key things to remember. You're taking over normal processes of wound healing 
um, and inflammation, and they're being, it's like a pirate. I forgot, I was gonna have like a ship of a pirate ship, and the cancer is like a pirate that takes it all over. But, you know, the person, you know, either was exposed to some like mutagen and subsequent promoters or primarily hypoxia. Hypoxia is the big one to get. Um, can there be mutagens that can increase the risk of cancer? Of course there are, but the primary issue is hypoxia. That's an essential thing to remember and to know. Okay, upper regulation of VEGF induced by tissue factor can set up a perpetuating, self-perpetuating feedback loop, a vicious cycle, feedback loop, as noted earlier, where VEGF expression also upregulates tissue factor. So they start going back and forth, this formation of a clot and VEGF. They just keep amplifying each other. Thrombin activates proteases. Yeah, we talked about that to digest their way through. Uh, the, pro the protease activation leads to release of growth factors, great, from platelets. And then this facilitates detachment of endothelial cells from their basement membrane. Yeah, they have to break off their basement membrane because the cancer has to grow through and get into the blood vessel before it can metastasize and spread, okay? Um, and then also growth factors, they're stimulating cell division, replication of your cancer. You don't want that, okay? And these anti-apoptosis factors, they're telling the cancer, no, 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 you don't need to die. You don't need to go into cell death. You can live, okay? Okay, dietary fat increases obesity and diabetes, which both increase the risk of cancer. Obesity, you're gonna have more blood lipids because some of the lipid is released into the blood and you're gonna get more insulin resistance. Insulin resistance raises insulin. That's called hyperinsulinemia, meaning more insulin in the blood. Well, insulin's a mitogen, meaning it causes mitosis, increases cell replication. You don't want a mitogen being uh, sprayed on your cancer, making it divide more, not good. Um, also, the diabetes-related blood hyperglycemia causes other problems, including more atherosclerosis, microvascular disease. The fat tissue makes, uh, has more of the enzyme aromatase, makes more estrogen. Now you get our estrogen, which is a growth factor for breast uh, ductal tissue, for prostate tissue, and for endometrial tissue of the uterus. So that's a tumor promoter, okay? Diabetes, hyperglycemia, we talked about that. The advanced glycation end products that are formed in the context of insulin resistance, those go around and they actually can activate something called NADPH oxidase. They cause more reactive oxygen, more oxidative stress, contributes to hypoxia and cancer, okay? Diabetes impairs immune system function. Immunosuppression helps cancer to grow. I'm telling you, diabetes is like this evil disease at the root of tons of problems, all right? Like I said, whenever I see all these screwed up patients, they're almost always hypertensive and diabetic, hypertensive and diabetic. That's like almost a given. That's why if I had either one of those diseases, I'd get my sodium down as low as I could. I'd minimize my dietary fat intake, manage my stress and try to control it as much as I could by doing that. You might have to take medicines on top of that, but I would try to control it if possible without medicines. And it probably would be possible. Type 2 diabetes, you betcha. McDougal says type 2 diabetes is 100% curable. 100%. That's the exact words out of Dr. McDougal. Okay, diabetes, the immune system is weakened. Yep. Okay, excessive estrogen when present activates the so-called PPAR gamma switch, tricks the body into thinking as if it was pregnant. So it wants to gain weight, save that weight, that energy. The baby might need it. Okay, animal fat, especially saturated fat in excess, will stiffen plasma membranes. That increases blood viscosity, makes the blood less thick because the red blood cells are less deformable. Blood pressure goes up, vicious cycle of hypertension, endothelial injury from hypertension, leading to atherosclerosis. I talked about that in my atherosclerosis lectures, but it's all bad. All this stuff is a bad cycle. Dietary fat, excessive dietary sodium, they only lead to problems. Okay. Dietary fat also causes leaky gut, more inflammation. You get that whole uh, postprandial after eating lipotoxemia, endotoxemia. It's a big mess. You get xenocyolitis, another mechanism of inflammation. Animal foods cause inflammation. Okay, does fat cause cancer? There's also the most common fat in the human body is palmitic acid. You know, when it's deprotonated, you call it palmitate. It's a C16, zero double bonds. Um, makes up about 30% of all the fatty acids in the human body, like for plasma membranes, etc. cetera. Um, main source is from meat, of course. Sat fat main source is meat. Uh, cancer cells will sometimes express high levels of plasma membrane CD36 receptors. Here's a paper on the subject. I don't really want to get into this too much, but the point is 
your cancer cells, they need tons of lipid because in order to divide, a cancer cell is of one size, it has to double its size so it can split in half and divide. So a cancer cell that's going to double many thousands, tens of thousands times, it needs tons and tons of lipid to make all those plasma membranes. It has to double itself before it can divide. Okay. Elevated cholesterol is associated with increased cancer risk, and you produce this metabolite called 27-hydroxycholesterol, and that can function. It can have some estrogen-like properties, um, and when you lower your total cholesterol, you lower 27-hydroxycholesterol, uh, and when that is elevated, it seems associated with increased uh, rate of cancer growth. Okay, now what about fish oil? There's a lot of people promoting fish oil. I personally think fish oil is a bad idea. Okay, just so you know, there's some uh, papers showing there's increased risk of prostate cancer with fish oil. Men who had the highest blood DHA had increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer. This guy's a pretty well-known researcher, Theodore Brasky. Here's one of his big papers. Plasma phospholipid fatty acids and prostate cancer risk in the SELECT trial. Okay. Uh, more papers. Omega-3s also can suppress the immune system. PUFAs associated with increased risk of colon cancer metastases. Um, promotion of colon cancer metastases in a rat by fish oil. Okay, you know, it's thought they immunosuppress. They also cause insulin resistance. I would not. I would recommend to avoid them. Okay, why do women have big butts? Okay, women have big butts for a couple reasons. Number one, it's sort of like a peacock display of fertility. You see a woman with a narrow waist and a big butt, you think she's fertile. Okay, the wider pelvis of a woman also enables her to deliver a baby with a bigger head so the kid can be born a little later than otherwise would be possible. And also, they carry their omega-3 fats largely in their gluteal region because it's an energy, energetically efficient location. And the baby will need some of those at the time of its birth and its early um, uh, nursing. And so it's efficient to carry them there. Because in the, in the ancient world, our ancestors, they, didn't, they worried about starvation. That was always the problem. Okay? And that's why a super anorexic woman, like some of those marathon running females, they might not be able to have a baby because they don't got enough omega-3 fats. They're too skinny. Okay, but being too skinny is a rare problem in the modern world. Okay, here's the point. There's plenty of adequate amounts of omega-3 and omega-6 fats. We can't put the double bond in the omega-3 position or the omega-6 position, but this is important to know. Lots of populations in the past were landlocked. They didn't have access to fish, and they didn't need it, okay? You've got plenty of omega-6s and omega-3 fats and regular old plant foods. You don't need nuts either. Just from your fruits and your vegetables and your starches, you get plenty of it. It's, a, it's really a non-issue, okay? Everybody's always freaked out about the things that don't matter. Where are you going to get your protein? Where are you going to get your calcium? Where are you going to get your omega-3s? Don't worry about it. That's not, those are non-issues. Be afraid of being potassium depleted. Be afraid of being magnesium depleted. Be afraid of being low in fiber. That's what Americans are because they don't eat enough plant foods. Okay, so what lowers the risk of a fat-induced cancer? Well, gee, plant foods have their alkaline, so they help to reverse the acidity of the cancer microenvironment. They've got antioxidants, so they help to reverse their, their reactive oxygen species that are associated with high-fat diet, okay? Exercise improves insulin sensitivity, so you don't get all those bad things associated with insulin, the advanced glycation end products, the mitogenic hyperinsulinemia, okay, the ischemia of tissues from microvascular disease, okay? They also, that exercise gets your lymphatic flow, and just like it squeezes the veins to get blood back to your heart, it squeezes your lymphatics to move that lymphatic fluid along so the white blood cells, they travel through that and they surveil the entire body. So you're helping your, your immune system to do its job by exercising. Our ancestors walked around all day looking for food. They exercise far more than modern people do. Okay, dietary sodium vasoconstrictor. You clamp down those arteries, you cause hypoxia. That's bad. Stress and stress equivalents, you know, caffeine, it activates platelets. Activated platelets can hide metastatic tumor. I showed a paper the other day that, you know, just a one gram tumor, one gram can release a million. It routinely released three million uh, cancer cells uh, in one day. The point being is your immune system is constantly removing these, and it's great at it, okay? It's great at it. The human body is a genius at doing stuff. I mean, like we said, if you eat a meal, how would you know how much you need of every individual nutrient? Your gut knows that. It's, it's, it's genius at doing what it has to do. Okay, um, 
Stress also makes the blood more prothrombotic, and that can cause tissue hypoxia. So it, it does bad things. A little bit of stress we need, of course, to get through our day to be paying attention, to be alert enough to do whatever we have to do. But excessive amounts, uh, they're, they're harmful to us. Lack of sleep makes that worse. Caffeine, to me, caffeine's like the stupidest thing. Oh, my life is so stressful. I wish I didn't have such a stressful life. I think I need a cup of coffee. You know, stupid, okay? You're just raising, it just raises the same hormones, the catecholamines and the cholesterol. It's just stupid, okay? And everybody says, well, I love coffee. Well, look, let me tell you something. When you quit, I used to drink coffee too. I didn't know any better. I drink one or two cups a day. Once I quit, it took me a while. It took about two weeks before I came back to my regular self. For some people, it takes them a month, but then you'll feel so much better to be done with it. I have separate videos on, you know, caffeine and, you know, quitting coffee and all that kind of stuff. Having an attitude of gratitude, sense of purpose, all that stuff uh, lowers your stress, you know. Being skinny uh, improves your lipid profile. Okay, here, oxidative stress and its role in angiogenesis and vascular disease. Angiogenesis, like we talked about, normal and wound healing, but it's especially activated by hypoxia. Okay, and this in turn promotes formation of reactive oxygen species, ROS. The reactive oxygen, especially through the mitochondrial electron transport chain reactions, but also through NADPH, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate oxidase. So you just hear it abbreviated NADPH, okay? That also produces reactive oxygens. And where do you get that activated? From a lot of ways, but the main way that relevant to our purposes today would be from your advanced glycation end products, from your diabetes. Well, how'd you get those AGEs, advanced glycation end products? You got it from eating fat, okay? So don't do that. Okay, um, thereby, okay, so reactive oxygen species promote angiogenesis via the generation of peroxidized lipids. Yeah, lipid peroxidation of all your PUFAs your unsaturated fats, okay? Things like your omega-6s and potentially your omega-3s, potentially your MUFAs, are generated in excess during atherosclerosis, thereby they link atherosclerosis to pathological angiogenesis. Atherosclerosis causes tissue hypoxia. And although the main mechanism involves hypoxia-inducible factor and VEGF, there are several pathways that are VEGF independent. That's kind of the whole point of this article. It's gonna show that reactive oxygens can cause um, activation of the angiogenic pathways even without going directly through uh, the hypoxia mechanism. Okay, so here's a good definition. Oxidative stress is defined as an imbalance between pro-oxidant and antioxidant systems. Yeah, the lower your antioxidant system, meaning the less plants you eat, the more vulnerable you are to oxidative stress. So eat more plants and raise your oxidative stress. Eat less iron and lower your, uh, your pro-oxidant things, okay? All right, now a little bit about the chemistry of oxidative stress. We're not gonna go into much chemistry, but just a couple of key points. And if you look at electron transport, you give one, S, one electron to oxygen, it becomes superoxide anion, bad. You give two electrons, it becomes hydrogen peroxide, kinda bad. Um, if it gets three electrons, hydroxyl radical, um, that's really bad, but you want it to become a water molecule, okay? Uh, Superoxide anion is known to be a main contributor to the generation of most reactive oxygen species and a crucial mediator of electron transport chain reactions in mitochondria. Usually superoxide anion is rapidly removed by superoxide dismutase and then it ends up getting made into water. Okay, we talked about that. In the mitochondria, particularly at complexes one and three of the transport chain, premature electron leakage to oxygen occurs. Right, when the gradient gets too high, like with uh, insulin resistance due to excess dietary fat. Um, and that will generate oxidative stress. And now here's NADPH oxidase. It's an enzyme that generates superoxide anion because it transfers electrons from NADPH to oxygen. And that's a major source of reactive oxygen species in some cell types, including endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells. So that's a potential big deal. And we talked about how diabetes increases that. Diabetes is due to increasing fat. So we Increasing dietary fat leading to diabetes leads to increased reactive oxygen, leads to angiogenesis, and also to hypoxia, increased cancer risk. Okay, one of the main consequences of reactive oxygen species in the presence of peroxidation of lipids, in vivo, this affects cellular membranes, including PUFAs that are already present there, and they are particularly prone to oxidation, and they generate an array of biologically active agents. These oxidation generated secondary compounds can be even worse than the initial reactive oxygen species itself. Okay, here's from that same paper. And this diagram is basically gonna show you excessive dietary lipids, especially the PUFAs, they can 
on their own activate angiogenesis. So they can be a problem just on their own, not to mention the fact that they can also contribute to hypoxia, increase HIF, hypoxia-inducible factor. Okay. Um, in several pathologies exemplified by diabetic retinopathy, reactive oxygen species-mediated angiogenesis is strongly associated with VEGF expression. Yeah, sort of down the hypoxia pathway. There's a number of compelling uh, papers that report the augmentation of angiogenesis by oxidation products, oxidated lipid products from oxidized lipids from lipid peroxidation. Okay. And this is reminiscent of all those papers I talked about in my previous lectures on the whole Dr. Yamashima's work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is just showing. Uh, when you get this process going and you've got the hypoxia, vascular endothelial growth factors released, and it then has a chemotactic effect on the, uh, my, the monocytes. They're monocytes in the blood. They're smaller. They then pass into the subintimal space beneath the intima, the intima lining, and then they enlarge and become macrophages, so they've got more capability to do things like phagocytize things. Okay, uh, but remember, hypoxia is the big thing that starts this whole mess. Oh, here was just that paper we talked about before, a one gram tumor, one gram tumor. And this is in, in rats, but they show that it routinely shed 3.2 times 10 to the 6, 3 million cells in an average day. Okay, so your immune system is pretty busy removing all that crap. You need a good immune system. There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Okay, and then here's just one paper showing they fed a bunch of a person just a bunch of plant, uh, plant foods, plant chemicals, and they had dramatic ability to prevent growth of breast cancer cells, okay? And yeah, I know these guys had a conflict of interest. They're trying to promote their, they call it a phytochemical, plant chemical uh, supplement, but the point that I'm making is they can still show that, okay? Whether or not their actual supplement's gonna be good in clinical practice, you know, who knows? Probably not. Most things don't quite make it when they go to clinical practice, but the point that by plant foods, they can show, uh, and by the way, I know nothing about their plant, their supplement. I know nothing about their chemicals. I have no interest in it, none whatsoever. The reason I showed you that paper was simply, it's just a, you know, a proof of principle. Plant foods, they kick ass on cancer, okay, and, and all these research experiments. And so you want that stuff going into your body. Get all those antioxidants. Avoid all that, uh, those fats. Avoid that hypoxia. And here was just some other paper by Gotsky, a real famous researcher, showing that lots of breast cancers spontaneously resolved, went away on their own. Why? Because the immune system got control of them. All right, why do doctors prescribe fish oil? If you talk to internists, and I know a lot of internists, and they're real nice, they're going to tell you, well, it's been proven to lower triglycerides in the blood. Okay, fine. It has a mild anticoagulant effect. Okay, fine, but it has a lot of other problems. It turns out to not really be cardioprotective in my reading of the literature. It turns out to not really help the brain or the retina, even though it was thought that it would do that. Okay, so a little bit about uh, structure of fatty acids. So a fatty acid is a carboxylic acid. So you got a carbon with a double bond to oxygen and then another bond to a hydroxyl group. When it's deprotonated, the proton H goes away. You just see an O minus there. It'll have a negative charge on it. Here's the fatty acid tail, and that's just a bunch of carbons stuck together. Hydrophobic means it's nonpolar, uh, so it's like oil, uh, the fat is, and it won't, it won't uh, be soluble in water by itself. The hydrophilic component has a charge on it, that, thus it's called polar, because this is, usually it's going to be deprotonated, so that'll be O minus. This is nonpolar. Um, it's amphipathic in the sense like an amphibian can live on land and water. Amphipathic means that it's partly polar, soluble in water, partly not the fatty acid tail. A little bit about structures. Here's sat fat, meaning no double bonds in the fatty acid tail. Then here's your carboxylic group. Here's a MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acid. Uh, olive oil is kind of famous for having a lot of MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acid. Mono means one double bond. A PUFA is a polyunsaturated fatty acid, and it will have more than one double bond. So here's, this is the omega end, the one far away from the carboxyl end. The carboxyl end is over here, also called the delta end. The methyl end is also called the omega end, and that's the, s the symbols of omega. So anyways, if you count from these uh, omega end carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, so this would be an omega-6 fat. If it was an omega-3 fat, there'd be a double bond at the three position. Anyways, there's always more than one in a PUFA, 
and usually there's a carbon intervening with no double bond attached to it and that hydrogen on here is called the methylene bridge this is called the methylene bridge that's the methylene bridge hydrogen and it just is weakly held so it gets plucked off and you create these cascades of lipid peroxidation okay here's families of fatty acids you know here's the c18 family the c18 no double bond c18 one double bond two double bond three double bond the two double bond includes a, a one at the six position omega six position and that's called linoleic acid i remember two letters la for linoleic acid two double bonds and then ala is alpha linolenic acid and this one has three double bonds and this is the omega-3 and that's sort of like the one that people always talk about as being so good and so important but just eat your plant foods. You'll get all that you need. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, just to show the nomenclature in a little more detail. So it's oleic acid, C18, one double bond. That's like your olive oil, the MUFA, one double bond, one right there. I remember O for oleic, O for number one. Okay, and that's oleic acid, olive oil. Linoleic acid, LA, two letters, two double bonds, C18, two double bonds right there. Okay, ALA, three letters, three double bonds right there. You don't have to know this. It's just if you want to know it. This is how it is, and I, I, I play it like a game. Arachidonic acid, I think arach, four letters, and I remember it's a C20 fatty acid with four double bonds, okay? EPA, icosa penta, penta means five, penta for five bonds, C20 carbons, five double bonds. Docosa hexa, hexa, hexa means six, six double bonds. So that's how I can remember these pretty easy. Um, if you want to, that's how you do it. You know, it's not essential to do that, but if you, Spend a lot of time reading about these sorts of things. You might find that convenient to know. What about blood glucose and obesity? Omega-3 fats cause increased insulin resistance. They're associated with weight gain. Uh, increased risk of prediabetes, diabetes. So here's one paper, effective fish oil on insulin, non-insulin dependent diabetes. Here's another article associated with omega-3s, increased risk of insulin resistance, omega-3 fatty acids and fish consumption, and risk of type 2 diabetes. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, any type of popular food that somebody's making a lot of money off, it's going to get all these fake industry-funded studies to say how great it is. You know, I don't see anything good coming from ingesting oil. Okay, problems with eating fish. There's also tons of saturated fat in fish. Look at um, salmon. It's 50% fat, 50% protein. Remember, there's no carbohydrate in meat. I mean, that's a terrible food. Then you're going to fry it on it, or you're going to cook it on nonstick cookware, then you're going to get all the POFAs. Uh, you don't want that, all the F-minus from frying stuff. Cooking oxidizes PUFAs. Well, then you're going to have oxidized PUFAs and lipid peroxidation. It's a disaster. And then the fish it tends to have lots of mercury, PCBs, endocrine disrupting chemicals, estrogenics. It's a terrible food. It's for chumps. It's also quite acidic. I wouldn't eat that junk. Okay, what about lipid peroxidation? PUFAs are much more vulnerable to that. We talked about the methylene bridge carbon. Okay. There's tons of double bonds. Look at this. EPA got five double bonds. DHA's got six. The more double bonds, the more lipid peroxidation you get. I don't think it's smart putting that stuff in your body. Okay, we talked about the more uh, fish oil, the higher DHA level, the more prostate cancer. There's some papers also showing the increased risk of cancer associated with omega-3s. Okay, can they get enough from plants? Yeah, I told you about it. You can convert the 18-2, uh, the just two double bonds, and the 18-3, three, three double bonds. You can make those into the longer chain omega-6s and omega-3 fatty acids. You don't need to be eating anything bigger than that. And this is what you just get from plant foods. You get from plant foods what you need, and that's all you should get. Okay, here's just some uh, an example of the amount of omega-3s you get from plant foods, which is plenty. It's a non-issue. Oh crap, how did I end up how did I end up there? Okay. Oh, so I know what I gotta do. Alright, what is the evolutionary perspective? Well, <coughs> theoretically, humans came from chimpanzee like ancestor and chimps and gorillas, for what it's worth, they don't eat fish. Humans don't need to eat fish. That's completely bogus. If you put a dead fish in front of me, I would not be eager to take a bite out of it. You put you know, bowl of fruits in front of me, I would be very eager to take a bite out of it. Theoretically, we supposedly arose in Africa. That's actually a controversial statement, but let's just say we did, and maybe that's true. Okay, where well, it's really hot in a tropical climate, guess what? You don't need fish oil to cool you off there, okay? Heat causes oxidation of those poofas. It would be unhealthy. A fish at a watering hole in a hot tropical climate would be expected to have far less poofa than they would from near Antarctica. 
When you look at a fish, do you want to eat it? No, it's disgusting. Fish is an animal muscle, therefore it's full of animal protein and fat. The health of Asian populations previously attributed to fish, which they ate hardly any of, very little most of them, is much more likely due to rice, which they ate tons of rice. Okay, which doctors recommend to avoid fish oil? McDougall's like the big expert, you know, uh, and, and he recommends to, don't be taking any of the omega-3 supplements, plant-based or fish-based. Uh, he goes on and he's got lectures on it. And it's pretty convincing. You watch his work, and I've read a lot from other sources. I don't see any reliable source recommend to take omega-3 oils, in my opinion, from what I've seen and read. <clears throat> you know, somebody shows me a paper can convince me otherwise, I'd be willing to look at it, but give me a mechanism too. Because a lot of times in industries will say, this is a great thing, it does all these great things. You go, where's the mechanism? I don't see any mechanism that it's going to be able to counteract the negatives associated with it, like lipid peroxidation for directly ingesting these long chain with all these double bonds. They're going to get lipid peroxidase like that. I mean, that's why if you buy fish oil in a store, you have to put it in a radio-opaque container and lock it and keep it in the fridge. Why? Because just sunlight will oxidize it, yet alone, and having it in a fridge at a very cold temperature, yet alone room air oxidizes fat. What do you think happens as soon as you put it in your body and you're 98.6 degrees? You're going to oxidize that stuff pretty fast. There's a pretty high risk of that. I would be worried about that. Look at Kempner and the like, most incredible results of anybody ever. He's feeding people 95.5, <clears throat> like around 5% protein. Can't get lower in fat than that. And actually, I think it's even more tight than that. I think I recall it was more like around 4.5% protein and 3 or 4% fat. It was really low, incredibly low. Okay, Winnitz was a paper where he had people on chemically defined diets. They were eating less than 1% fat, less than 1% fat, and he only gave them omega-6s. And the, his patients did great with no adverse physical or psychological effects. Okay, so that's rather extraordinary, all right? Less than 1% fat, less than 1% fat, okay? So all these people talking about good fats, give me a break. McKean uh, did his paper in 1970, something similar. He had phenylketonuric children, and he also fed them the same uh, chemically defined diet as Winnett's, less than 1%. Now I'm talking one, just the number one, less than 1% fat, and these children grew well and did very well. So what I'm saying is we really don't need much fat. It's impossible to be too low in fat. And when I say the only good fat is fiber, it means that a small amount of fiber gets converted into fat. I've talked about that in other lectures. And so the point I'm saying is there's this whole big push. Oh, you need all this fat, you need all this flax and soy and olive oil and fish oil, or just call it omega-3 oil plant sources. I don't believe it. I don't buy it. I don't see, I don't see a reason for it. all these nuts and seeds. I don't see it. They're all commercially profitable foods. I don't see a physiologic need for these things. I agree with McDougall on this one. I think he's absolutely right. Esselstyn, no oil, not one drop of any oil. He's a smart guy, man. He cares about atherosclerosis. He's right. No oil. None of them are good for your uh, atherosclerosis. Anything that promotes diabetes and atherosclerosis and hypoxia is not going to help you. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, Dr. Klaper used to recommend fish oil, but after studying it more, he doesn't do that anymore. Okay. What is olive oil? We talked about it. It tends to be about 70% MUFA oleic acid, um, which is an omega-9 type of fat. Olea is like Latin word for olive. Olive oil also though, has got palmitic acid, about 13%. That's a lot of saturated fat. I wouldn't want to eat anything 13% saturated fat. And it's got about 10% omega-6s. So that's what I think is funny. Look at this omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. It's like 10 to 1 omega-6. Okay, so you're going to have a lot of people saying, oh, I want my omega-3 to omega-6 ratio to be better. Yeah, well, look at this stuff. 10 to 1 omega-6s. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, it's just, you know, it tastes good. It's associated with the whole ancient Greek tradition, the Mediterranean diet. So, like, I have some Greek friends, man. They get pissed off if I criticize olive oil. I don't ever criticize it around them. But I'm just telling you, it has the best, you know, advertising. You know, extra virgin olive oil. Sounds like you're winning your bride, going to have, you know, exciting romance. You know, like it's a lubricant or something. No, it's, it's a highly processed food that's not good for your health. Um, olive oil increases postprandial triglycerides bad it, it reduces flow mediated vasodilation so it makes your arteries more narrow um, this guy Vogel sort of the famous cardiologist who does these uh, brachial artery reactivity tests for vasodilation after eating fats and 
Olive oil was bad. It was worse than canola oil. The Leon Heart Study showed the people eating the olive oil. They were 40 times worse off than the Esselstyn study uh, uh, for increased risk of cardiovascular events like myocardial infarction. Uh, here's another paper. This is by this guy Silva. Detrimental effect of olive oil and all these other oils, soybean and palm oils, on endothelial function. Here's another paper, Blankenhorn, 1978. Cardiac calf follow-up at three years showed it didn't matter what fat they ate. MUFAs, sat fats, PUFAs, omega-6s, omega-3s, they all had significant increase in new atherosclerotic lesions. To prevent coronary artery disease, one must reduce total fat intake, okay? So and there's a guy by the name of Rudell with MUFAs and atherosclerosis. The MUFA diets were not atheroprotective. Dr. Esselstyn's written on this extensively. Dr. McDougall spoke about this extensively. Um, and then there's the famous African green monkey study that thought to have metabolism similar to humans, and there was no atheroprotective effect from eating, uh, from changing from dietary sat to MUFA. So both sat fat and MUFAs were bad. So you're screwed. You see how you're screwed no matter what you do with fat? You're screwed if you do sat fat because it's atherogenic and it causes insulin resistance. You're screwed with omega-3s because they cause insulin resistance, insulin resistance, diabetic predisposition, and they increase the risk of some cancers. And you're screwed with MUFAs because they're also atherogenic, okay? Um, there's no win here, and, they, and, they, and, they're, and they're, they're vasospastic. The, there's no win. Okay, now here's the famous bed of Odysseus and Penelope. And after 20 years in the Trojan War, when Odysseus returned home to Penelope, she wasn't sure it was really her husband. She thought it was, but she wasn't sure. And she said, do you want me to move the bed? And of course he knew, you can't move the bed because actually it's built around, attached to the tree. And so once he knew that, she knew he really was her love, her long lost love. A beautiful story of the idiot and the oddity. Okay. All right, is olive oil good for you? We kind of went through this all the way. Um, oh, yeah, and I think that was the problem. Like, you look at all these Indian male doctors. You know, they're smart, they're nice, they're skinny. And you think, well, wow, they're so healthy. But it turns out in India, there's a pretty high incidence of diabetes and hypertension. And after studying it for a while, my conclusion was, I think it's because they eat so much fried food. Um, oh, other things, other problems with oils. Grassy, dietary, oleic, and palmitic acid increased postprandial factor seven. It's a clotting factor, okay? So this is oleic, your MUFA, olive oil-like, your palmitic acids, you know, those are your sat fat oils. Because also there's another group of uh, people who don't know what they're talking about on nutrition who try to say, oh, no, all the, all the, you know, the unsaturated fats are bad, but sat fat is good and coconut is good. No, they're all bad. There, there's no way to win with them. Dietary polyunsaturated fats and the composition of aortic plaques. Um, so these were bad. Um, Esselstyn wrote a nice uh, summary of oils. He wrote, Is Oil Healthy? International Journal of Disease uh, Reversal and Prevention. Uh, that's a good article. I read that. Uh, with cooking, other damaging things happen to those oils. Insulin resistance. Okay, we talked about that one paper about the fatty acids getting across the membrane even if you tried to block all the protein transporters. That There's really nothing you can do except reduce your dietary intake of fat. Um, so from what I've read, I think omega-6s are worse than olive oil, but they're both bad. Why eat anything that's bad? And they're both highly processed. Um, all oils are bad. That is my conclusion from my extensive study of the subject. Oh, here's some references. If anybody wants to look, here's the first set of references. Here's the second set of references. I got one more thing of references. So that's all the reference. So the bottom line is this. Saturated fat contributes to hypoxia, contributes to insulin resistance, diabetes associated with hypoxia, and you can't win with it in my opinion. The only thing you can do is reduce your dietary intake of fat. That's what I recommend. And the small amount you get from the fiber and plant foods and from the little amount of fat that's normally present in plant foods, that's plenty of fat. It's impossible to be too low in fat. So hope that was helpful.